Right, that's it recording. Right. Thank you very much and welcome to the Development Standards Committee. Uh, obviously, it's hosted remotely. Um, item one, apologies for absence. We have an apology from Council Lundia. Any declarations of interest? Yes, yeah. convener. Yes, convener, I have one. Councillor Brace, yes. Yes, uh, I need to declare an interest in item six, report 22620. Uh, uh, two of my brothers um, own the access route into the development at East Balachy, the proposed development. Uh, so I will be leaving the meeting while that's discussed and take no part in it. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you, convener. It's a general declaration which I think will affect item six, and that is I'm a member of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And you will participate in the meeting? I will participate in the meeting. Thank you very much, sir. Any, any more declarations of interest? No. No, convener. Right. Uh, item three, building warrants. The committee is asked to note that during the period 10th of June to the 5th of September 2020, a total of 136 building warrants, seven demolition warrants, and 18 amendments to warrant have been approved with an estimated cost of £6,099,868. Now, now, you'll have been sent these, these figures. Item four, delegated decisions. Now, these figures have been updated since you've been sent your figures. The committee is asked to note that during the period 7th of June to the 5th of September 2020, a total of 157 planning applications have been approved and four refused under the scheme of delegation to officers. Is that noted? Noted. Minutes of the previous meeting, is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Right, on to planning applications. Item six. Sorry, convener, can I just interrupt? Um, Councillor Brees, we're going to move you to the waiting room and then the IT host will bring you back when we're finished. Okay, I'll wait patiently, thank you. <laughs> right. Item six. Thank you, convener. Um, item six uh, is the planning application uh, for uh, a solar park. Can I have the next slide, please, Ali? Uh, for the installation of a sol solar PV array and a battery en energy storage system and a private wire grid connection and associated infrastructure for Scottish Power Renewables. Uh, the solar PV array uh, is capable of generating um, around 39.9 megawatts of energy. Um, just for ease of reference, for the rest of the presentation, I'll make reference to it being a 40 megawatt installation. Next slide, please, Ali. So looking at the site, uh, the site, it's a big site. It measures uh, 161.6 hectares. That's almost 400 acres. Um, uh, it, it lies around four kilo kilometres northwest of Montrose and around 2.5 kilometres north of the Montrose Basin. Um, the site also lies 2.5 kilometres northwest of Hillside, uh, around 1.9 kilometres north of um, the A935 road between Vrechen and Montrose, and uh, about 0.9 kilometres north of the policies of House of Dunn. Um, access is taken directly from the C35 road, which runs between the A935 and the A92. Uh, sorry, excuse me, the A90. Uh, that's the, the road uh, you could maybe just make out in yellow, uh, running up the left-hand side of the screen, uh, where it joins with the site uh, denoted in red. Uh, it, the C35 joins with the A90 about 3.8 kilometres uh, north of the site uh, and the access route to the site would mainly be from 
the A90 and the C35. There are two specific elements to the proposal. The first is the solar PV array, which as I've mentioned, would be capable of generating uh, 40 megawatts of power. And within that uh, area, which is denoted in the plan in front of you, within the roughly rectangular area, uh, there would also be a battery en energy storage system. Uh, that's mentioned in the report as a BESS, and that's capable of storing 10 megawatts of power. Uh, there would also be a private wire grid connection uh, that would take up roughly 79.5 hectares of land. Um, it would be installed in an open trench type installation uh, and it would cover a linear distance of around 7.5 kilometres with roughly four kilometres of that taking place through the urban area of Montrose. It would terminate at the stopped up uh, section of road that lies just to the north of Glaxo Smith Klein's facility uh, in the Montrose Port area, uh, just to the east of Provost Street Road. Um, so, uh, moving on from the site itself, um, we're going to look at the, the PV installation first uh, in isolation, and then we'll move on after that to the cable route itself. Next slide, please, Ali. So looking at the uh, general arrangement of the, the PV installation, uh, access, is, as I've said before, is taken from the C35, which lies to the, the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, the access route runs past uh, West Balachie. Um, it's a roughly around 800 metres long. And the general arrangement of the site shows uh, the solar panels facing due south at an angle of uh, roughly 25 degrees. Um, there would be 140,000 solar panels installed uh, within this in installation, and, and they'd be mounted on frames that are driven uh, roughly two meters into the ground, uh, forming um, solar modules within the site. The battery energy storage system lies to the right-hand side of the screen. That's uh, the, the pink square. Um, you can see that that is uh, contained by the Glenwood and Glenskinnell wood to the right hand side uh, of the image and over on the, the, the left hand side of the image is also the dam wood which offers screening uh, for the development. Um, you can see uh, denoted in the sort of uh, lilac colour um, an internal track layout the tracks within the site would be roughly four metres wide and would be formed in hardcore. Um, also on the left hand side of the image, you can just make out a black line running between the track to the south of the site and the track to the north. That track uh, would be a public footpath that would be installed to maintain public access rights across the land. Uh, this is land that's uh, subject to public access rights under the Land Reform Act. Um, additional screen planting would be installed around the battery energy storage system uh, and to the north, uh, east and west of the site and also to the south, um, denoted by the green lines. Um, the drainage swale uh, and, uh, to the south of the site is indicated by a blue line. Uh, drainage within the site would be dealt with uh, using swales and uh, native planting solutions. Um, SEPA and uh, the Council's Roads Department have um, had a look at the drainage arrangements and are generally satisfied with those, although conditions would be attached uh, requiring further details of drainage um, swales uh, and their general arrangement um, as part of any planning permission issued. Uh, the site would be contained by a two metre high stock proof fence. The exception to that would be around the battery en energy storage system. Uh, I'll mention that later on in the presentation. Uh, just to confirm, in the centre of the image you can see um, a woodland um, rectangle. That uh, is the fall. It was clear felled in uh, 2014 under a felling licence. There's also a high pressure gas pipeline runs to the site. You can see a break in the, the solar arrangement and that's where the pipeline runs. That feature has been subject to consultation with the Health and Safety Executive and National Grid and neither of those consultees raise objection to the proposal. Next slide, please, Ali. So 
we're looking at the uh, typical arrangement of the solar panel modules, you can see they'd be mounted on frames, um, various arrangements for getting the frames into the ground. We have a single post, double post, um, and a concrete base type. Uh, generally, it would be the non-concrete base type uh, frames that would be used. The concrete base type frames are only used in certain circumstances, for example, where there's underground archaeology that needs to be protected. Um, the panels would be, uh, as I've said before, tilted at a 25 degree angle to maximise their efficiency. Um, panels or, or the, the modules would be uh, up to six metres apart, between three and six metres apart, uh, depending on the, the topography, topography of the site um, and the ground conditions. Um, and the typical modules, as you can see at the bottom of the uh, screen there, would be uh, just over 20 metres long um, and would be spaced 0.5 metres apart. The overall height of the panels would be up to 3 metres in height, um, shown here at being up to 2.8, but maximum 3 metres um, at their highest point. Next slide, please, Ali. Excuse me. So looking at the battery energy storage system compound in some more detail, uh, you can see that uh, within it there would be 16 battery containers and I'll show you the detail of those uh, in a, a slide to follow. Uh, there would be six inverter containers with high voltage transformers within them. Uh, they're, they're the green uh, rectangles on the screen. Uh, there would be a substation unit and a spares container within that and also a track serving it and that would be contained by a three metre high palisade fence. As I've said before, the Glenwood and the Glen Skinner Wood uh, to the east of the site uh, and the north to some extent would screen this feature, but to the south and um, west additional screen planting would also be installed. Uh, roughly 3,000 square metres of additional planting would be installed uh, at that location. Uh, to the bottom of the screen, you can see the orange square, which is the uh, substation compound. That covers a, an area of about 400 square metres. And within that, there'd be a control building, the detail of which is shown on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, that building would be uh, around 5.5 metres high. Um, and conditions would be attached uh, on the final finishings of that building. Um, There'd also be a spares container within that compound, and again, that would be contained by a three meter palisade fence. Next slide, please, Ali. So looking at the battery storage, uh, battery container details, um, these are quite large containerized solutions, uh, 12 meters long, um, 2.5 meters wide, and 2.6 meters high with some um, cooling plant on top of them. As I've said, there'd be 12 of these uh, within the site. Uh, there would be noise associated with the cooling plant and uh, um, there has been a noise impact assessment submitted by the developer. Um, and that's been assessed by the Council's Environmental Health uh, Service. Um, they're generally satisfied with the uh, conclusions of it. However, um, conditions would be attached to ensure that noise within the site uh, is controlled to a satisfactory level. Next slide, please, Ali. Again, looking at the, uh, the inverter substation uh, arrangements, again, another containerized solution. Um, as I've said, I think there's six of these in the site, um, just over six meters long um, and roughly three meters high, roughly two and a half meters wide. Um, and again, um, the, con the, the general arrangement of other features of the site, so a two metre stock proof fence uh, and the relationship of a typical CCTV uh, monopole that uh, is a common feature of solar developments. Next slide please Ali. So before we move on, um, we need to consider that there will be an amenity impact on properties close to the site. Um, you can see there's uh, 22 properties within a two kilometre search area uh, around the site that would be the most affected by the actual overground installation. Excuse me. Um, 
particular attention is drawn to the properties um, denoted on that plan is uh, two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven. Uh, these are properties at uh, West Ballachy and North Mains of Dunn. Um, these would probably have the, the greatest uh, view of the site once it's been developed out. Um, again, down at 12, 13 and 14 is Ford House. Um, these are the closest properties to the south of the site directly. And then up at uh, number 16 is Glenwood of Crago. And that would, those would be the properties that would have the greatest impact from the east of the site. Um, landscape and visual impacts would also have to be uh, considered. Um, in terms of landscape impacts, we're considering uh, changes in the landscape elements, quality and character, and cumulative impacts uh, with other development of the same nature in the area. And similarly with visual effects, we're uh, considering changes uh, in appearance of the, of, of, of the area, changes in the quality of views, uh, changes in how views are perceived, and cumulative effects, again, with other development of a similar nature in the area. Next slide, please, Ali. So uh, this slide shows the view uh, from the track leading into Balachie. Um, the top slide shows the view um, pre-development and how it would look uh, post-development in the, the bottom slide. Um, since uh, uh, members will note from the um, submitted report, uh, that the site history indicates that similar development has been approved on this site in 2014. Although that development wasn't developed out, um, there is precedent for uh, develop, development of this nature at this site. Uh, since that time, the Council has uh, produced and adopted sub supplementary uh, guidance on low carbon energy development uh, and has undertaken a st strategic landscape capacity assessment. Um, the site has been identified as having major, medium capacity for solar development uh, within those documents. Uh, the local development plan also requires assessment in the context of the landscape character assessment uh, and the, the landscape in this area is dip slope farmland. Um, the applicant has undertaken a landscape impact and visual assessment and that indicates that the landscape can accommodate this development. Uh, the landscape effects are uh, determined as being moderate to moderate adverse but reversible uh, and uh, some landscape, uh, landscape mitigation is uh, proposed that would actually lead to some improvements at some parts of the landscape in the area. Uh, the assessment of the landscape impact uh, has been assessed by the relevant uh, consultees and the council and is considered to be uh, reasonable. Next slide please Ali. Um, again, looking at the site from the south, this is from the area of Ford House um, to the south, which I drew your attention to earlier. You can see that the, uh, the development uh, would be capable of being absorbed into the landscape. Uh, the top slide shows the uh, site before it's developed. Um, this is from a distance of around uh, three, uh, three, 300 metres to the south. Um, but as you can see, the top topography and landscape landscape features in the area um, screen this site reasonably well uh, from that distance uh, and from that direction. Next slide, please, Ali. Again, um, I drew your attention earlier to Glenwood of Crago, uh, to the northeast of the site. And again, these were the properties that are identified as having the greatest impact um, from that direction. Uh, this is at a distance of four, uh, 400 metres from the site. And again, uh, confirming that landscaping uh, and the landform and the existing screening, along with proposed screening, uh, would minimise impacts of the development on those properties. Uh, there would be direct localised effects, but depending on orientation uh, and property orientation, these would be reasonably minimal. Next slide, please, Ali. Excuse me. Looking from, at the site from further afield, uh, the top slide shows the view from New Biggin Farm, which is uh, located on the A935 corridor um, 
from a distance of around 2.65 kilometres from the site. Uh, as you can see, there's intervening landscape features and topography that lessens the impact from the development. And this view would be reasonably representative of views from other features in the area, uh, such as the Montrose Basin, uh, the north shores of the Montrose Basin, where there's recreational access. Um, again, looking at the, the bottom image, this is the view from the Wildlife Centre on the A92 across Montrose Basin from a distance of 5.7 kilometres. Uh, the panels uh, would be partly visible uh, at these distances, but the sim uh, they would result probably in a similar impact to polytunnels or, or similar development, which is a common feature of the, the landscape. Um, Similar development has been consented at Aritz Mill, which lies around three kilometres um, to the, uh, the south southwest of the site, which is on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, there wouldn't be any cumulative, uh, unacceptable cumulative impacts because, again, the uh, nature of the dip slope farmland in which these sites would be located, uh, the intervening topography and um, other landscape features, uh, would lessen the impact of these developments. Um, policies PV6 and PV9, um, they support development that would not result in an unacceptable adverse um, landscape and visual impacts. Uh, there's capacity in the landscape for the development. Uh, there's no um, unacceptable cumulative or individual impacts from this proposal. Um, similarly, um, the, the development would take place on land which is uh, defined by the James Hutton Institute as being prime agricultural land, uh, certainly some of the site. Um, however, policy PV20 um, lends support to developments which would not result uh, in irreversible um, impacts. Um, the policy supports uh, development where there would be acceptable restoration proposals um, and there's conditions attached to ensure that decommissioning and restoration would take place um, in a timely manner um, on the completion of the development after 35 years. Um, there's also conditions that would be attached to ensure that soil quality is maintained during construction. Next slide please Ali. Moving on to the, uh, the cable route itself. Um, and we're now looking at the underground infrastructure of the development. So moving away from the site at Balachay uh, back towards Montrose, you can see that the uh, installation would uh, consist of uh, uh, 33 kilovolt kilovo cables uh, being installed in an open trench. They'd be um, installed at a distance between a metre and uh, so the 800 um, millimetres and a metre um, in depth. This would uh, represent a private uh, grid connection um, and it would be installed in a, a 0.7 metre wide trench uh, moving across the landscape. There'd also be a fibre optic data cable installed and uh, an earth electrode uh, for, the, for the proposal. Uh, where the uh, installation cross, crosses roads, the tren trench width would be increased to 1.3 metres um, and there would be ducting installed uh, to protect the, uh, the cabling under the road. Uh, that part, where that installation method is used, the, the depth of the installation would be around uh, a metre in depth. Uh, the development would take place over around nine months, it's been indicated by the, the, the developer. This would be undertaken in a phased manner. Um, uh, there's conditions proposed that would uh, seek to ensure that uh, the phasing is in advance of the development taking place. Uh, there's also uh, been a declaration made by the developer that elect electromagnetic field uh, considerations would be within uh, ICNRP 1998 requirements, um, and that's uh, generally satisfactory. Next slide, please, Ali. 
So looking at the cable route itself, uh, it does have uh, potential to have impacts on the built and natural environment. As indicated uh, previously, uh, the, uh, the landscape within which the um, development would take place is quite high quality landscape. There are high quality features within that landscape, most notably the Montrose Basin. Uh, which is a, a protected area, uh, notable for features such as uh, its wild bird assemblages, uh, grey foot, uh, pink footed and grey lag geese. Um, again, there's the House of Dunn, which the house itself lies 1.5 kilometres south of the site, and its uh, design landscape policies uh, are, are 0.9 kilometres from the site at their closest point. Uh, Ecolo ecological impacts have been considered uh, through an ecological appraisal that was submitted by the developer. Uh, there are some impacts, but these can be mitigated uh, and there's conditions proposed to mitigate any impacts on, on ecology. Um, Council's appropriate assessment of, uh, of impacts under habitat regulations is attached at Appendix 5. And you'll see that there's uh, uh, no protected sites adversely affected in the council's view and this has been uh, undertaken in consultation with SNH who do not object to the proposal. Um, in terms of built heritage, heritage interests in the site, uh, there are none in the site itself. Um, however, there are listed buildings and uh, a conservation area in the vicinity. Um, settings of these would be temporary temporarily affected by the development during construction, but there would be no adverse or permanent impact on those features. Again, Historic Environment Scotland and archaeology have been consulted on this um, and offer no objection to the proposal. Um, there is a condition, however, that would be attached requiring a programme of archaeological works. Next slide, please, Ali. Um, the cable route itself, um, as it moves across the countryside, it won't uh, raise any significant concern um, until it gets to around Hillside, um, although it will uh, impact on su some features such as hedgerows and field boundaries um, and conditions would be attached to ensure those features are uh, restored post-development. Um, it's not until it gets to um, Dubton Terrace near Hillside um, that it really has a close interface uh, with um, sensitive property. Um, members will note there's been an objection from a resident at Dub Dubton Terrace um, in relation to noise, privacy, uh, visual impact, traffic impact, road safety and environmental impacts uh, from the development. However, it's been considered that subject to the attached conditions these impacts can be uh, mitigated and um, the effects on residents in Dubton Terrace would be temporary uh, and, and short-lived. Short um, they wouldn't result in permanent landscape or visual effects uh, and uh, again in terms of road safety and traffic impact these uh, matters have been con uh, considered in consultation with the Council's road service who offer no objection to the proposal. Next slide, please, Ali. You'll note in the submitted report that there's reference to an alternative cable route at Borrowfield. Um, the two routes um, you can just make out in the inset. Um, in the inset image um, on the right hand side of the screen, the two routes uh, denoted in blue, one in a, a solid blue line, one in a um, a dotted blue line. Um, the reasons for these two um, proposed routes is a combination of factors um, such as landowner consent, ground conditions and um, ecological interests. Both cable route options have been considered. Uh, both are equally acceptable um, and none would, uh, and both uh, would be ex uh, equally acceptable when considered against the requirements of the development plan. Uh, and other material considerations. Next slide, please, Ali. So moving into the urban area, um, 
the site uh, enters um, the build-up area of, of Montrose at Borrowfield. Um, you can see in the uh, left-hand hand image the route the the um, the cable would take coming under the railway line. Um, there's a, an underpass there which can be utilised. So there's <coughs> specialist um, techniques such as HDD to be deployed on this site. Um, it would then move past Borrowfield Primary School, which is located on New Hain Road, um, and that, that that's uh, denoted at the top top right of the the image. Uh, before moving along New New Hain Road uh, onto North Esk Road, um, before dog legging round onto Broomfield Road, and you can see uh, the general uh, locality on the the bottom right of the the image there. Um, there's a lot of features in this area. There's uh, supermarkets, um, uh, uh, there's businesses in the area, and it's quite a busy junction there. But again, traffic impacts have been considered uh, by the roads service. Uh, they raise no objection, but conditions would be attached uh, requiring uh, greater detail on construction management as the proposal moves through the site. Uh, next slide, please, Ali. Uh, just looking at uh, Newham Road in some more detail. Uh, this is probably the area where there's the greatest impact on residential property. Uh, the cable trench would be at its closest to residential properties probably at this point. Uh, again, conditions are attached uh, to con control dust, noise, vibration, and other amenity impacts. Um, there's construction access conditions uh, that would be attached as well as uh, uh, other access management uh, requirements. Um, there is roads capacity um, to take the development within the existing road infrastructure. Uh, no, no special arrangements would be required. Uh, and again, impacts would be short-lived and temporary uh, during the construction phase um, with the site fully restored to almost the same as it is now. After, after development. Next slide, please, Ali. So uh, the site from North Esk Road would then on to Rose Hill. Uh, the National Cycle Route's in this area. Uh, there'd be a close interface with the conservation area, um, but there would be temporary impact on the setting of that area only uh, during construction. Um, again, there's recreational access on the right-hand side of the screen there. Um, there'd be conditions requiring maintenance of uh, uh, access through an access management plan. Um, again, there are residential properties in the area who would experience some momentum impact. But again, short-lived uh, and temporary impacts only. Um, there has been an objection raised from a, a resident in this area which relates to an impact on a private parking area. Um, uh, the developers uh, indicated that if they were to use that area uh, as uh, a construction compound, for example, that it would be restored to its existing condition. However, this matter is a civil matter. It's not of material uh, planning consideration in the consideration of this application. Um, and it shouldn't be considered much further than that. Uh, next slide, please, Ali. We're following the route through the site, um, it then moves on to Winfield Road. Again, similar impacts. There's a reasonably close interface with residential property uh, and similar impacts to uh, has previously been uh, identified through noise, dust um, and vibration. But again, conditions attached to control these. There's no conservation area at this point. Um, Next slide, please, Ali. And then moving through onto Falls Road again, the similar arrangement with a mix of residential property uh, and recreational um, recreational uses in the area. Uh, there's links over to the right hand side of the of the screen uh, and other recreational uses in that area. Again, conditions are, are attached to ensure that recreational access and amenity um, impacts are controlled, as well as traffic impacts. Next slide, please, Ali. 
and then getting towards the end of the site now, um, underpassing Marine Avenue onto uh, Provost Reeds Road. Uh, again, there's no requirement for any specialist um, installation techniques. The underpass would facilitate uh, the, the installation. Um, the cable route would come down under the underpass there and then would move along um, the stopped up road on the right hand side of the screen where it would terminate just north of uh, the Glaxo Smith Klein site. Um, again, limited temporary impacts and conditions attached uh, to control uh, the impacts of development in this area. So the final slide please, Ali. So in conclusion, sorry. Uh, members will note in the report that uh, the developer has sought a longer time period in which to commence the development. Um, for the reasons given in the report, um, the 10 years that are sought uh, have not been granted. However, it is considered to be reasonable to grant a five year uh, time period for commencement of, of development. Uh, so a direction is attached um, to um, the, the report um, requiring or, or granting five years for commencement should members be uh, minded to approve. Uh, the members will also um, note that the application involves land which, in which the uh, council has a financial interest as landowner. However, the development is not considered to be significantly contrary to the development plan and there's therefore no requirement to notify the Scottish Ministers should members be minded to approve. But in conclusion, um, uh, the development would uh, result in a renewable energy development that would produce uh, equivalent uh, electricity power 12,000 homes uh, for an industrial user. There's no un unacceptable impacts on amenity uh, or environmental interests or landscape and visual impacts or impacts on the built and natural uh, heritage interests in the area. Uh, conditions would be proposed to mitigate any impacts. Uh, these would include precise detail um, and further support and technical information uh, and further mitigation um, for some of the impacts of the development. Uh, the develop development is compatible with the development plan policies and relevant supplementary guidance. There's previous site history, uh, which is similarly, similarly supported uh, solar PV development at the site. And there's no material considerations that would justify refusal. The committee has recommended the grant full planning permission subject to the conditions at section 10 of the report. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, do any other committee have questions to the officer? There's hands going up. Councillor Duff, followed by Councillor Miles. Yeah, thanks, convener, and thanks uh, to, to Mr. Agnew for a very full uh, description of the project. Um, th this may be a slightly unfair question, and I'm conscious maybe the, the SSE um, team may, or the sorry, a Scottish Power team may be able to answer this question. When this was first mooted, um, this um, underground um, delivery to a yet unspecified end user was 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 the sort of was 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 if you like option A, and I think they they indicated that if a deal could not be done, then potentially this could be taken to the the SSE uh, substation at uh, close to Bridge of Dunn. I guess what we've got here is we've got a definite application. This is what it is, and if there was to be any change then there would clearly have to be a new planning application for a route to an, you know, an alternative end user, if you like, to the, the substation at, at, um, at Bridge of Dunn. Um, that's, that's most likely to be the case. Um, <laughs> um, excuse me. <laughs> okay to, to answer that question, uh, <laughs> Councillor Duff. Um, you're quite right. Um, sorry, sorry, Mr. Ferrier, um, these are just questions from the member to the officer at the moment, and then that question may come back up again. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, before, before the dogs started barking. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's correct. 
there would be a requirement for a, an alternative route to be approved if that was the case. Um, the report sets out the developer's um, support and information has indicated that there's uh, the benefit of the private cable system that's proposed. Um, uh, there's benefits there for end user and opportunity for other users to to uh, tap into that, that cable route. Um, and that's the development as we understand it at the moment. Um, yeah. Happy enough with that reply? Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Kivia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Miles. Yes, uh, a few questions. Uh, firstly, on the site itself, uh, we saw from the pictures there was obviously uh, drainage issues. Uh, they said there would be a suitable drainage system on the site. Uh, that would include, I dare say, uh, tying in with the existing neighbouring drainage so it doesn't interrupt any neighbouring drainage through the site. Would that be correct? Uh, yes, as I said in the, the presentation, um, sorry, I probably hurried through it a wee bit, but um, there's conditions attached to uh, get the final uh, drainage um, details from the developer for further approval in consultation with uh, the roads department and uh, SEPA. Um, we're generally satisfied with the proposal to use swales uh, and localised planting solutions to deal with the drainage, um, but the final detail of the swales that would be proposed in and how they uh, interact with any other drainage in the area would be agreed subject to details that are required by condition. Yes, they would have to tie into existing drainage from neighbouring uh, fields and, and, and other things. So uh, just to, to make sure that that was, was in place. The other thing uh, you touched on was uh, after 35 years, it could be restored. I mean, I was always against uh, prime agricultural land being taken away. But they said this could be restored after 35 years or whatever length of the, the uh, project is. And uh, there'd be no impact if that's uh, restored. What would be the vegetation on the site uh, when it's actually in use? Just a grass cover or what? It would, it would be, uh, it would remain as, as, uh, as, as rough grass, yes. Um, there are some notions that you can use um, these sites uh, for rough grazing uh, while they're in use. Um, I'm not aware of any of the consented solar developments in Angus actually uh, making use of that, um, but it is possible to graze uh, within these sites while they're in use. But um, yeah, there would just be rough grass under the, under the panels really, apart from the tracks through the site. Okay, and they would be maintained, I dare say. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the, the site's maintained by expert contractors through its, through its lifetime. Okay. Now, moving on to the, the cable route. Uh, you said an open trench, but surely that open trench will be refilled so there's no impact on, on uh, land use and uh, the open uh, trench. Yeah, the, the trench will be backfilled. Um, there's uh, conditions attached to the report uh, which relate to uh, soil management to ensure that uh, the soil that's redeposited within the trench would be appropriately redeposited. As you know, um, you can't just take topsoil out and, and put it back in in any, any manner. So uh, there would be soil management conditions to ensure the quality of the land isn't degraded by the development. Yeah, and I, I take it any uh, field drains that are disturbed in, in uh, laying that open trench should be restored. So there's no impact on any, uh, any of that. That's correct. Any, any existing landscape features, uh, drainage, boundary treatments, vegetation, again, conditions are proposed that would ensure that any existing above ground features or underground features disturbed by the development would be appropriately re uh, restored uh, post development. And similarly, when we come to the urban environment, uh, you'd be uh, disturbing gas mains and, and, and other sewers and things. All that would be done, I dare say, uh, competently and, and safely, so there's no uh, danger in any of these connections. The, the developer would have to obtain the relevant consents to open the, open the roads or, or whatever land they're actually going to be developing on. But the, the operation itself isn't anticipated to be any different to any other urban infrastructure installation, whether that be the laying of a sewer 
um, a gas main, um, you know, an electricity main, anything like that. The, the, the cables proposed are 33 kilovolt cables, which are fairly common features um, in urban areas and rural areas. Uh, the, the type of cables you see mounted on poles around the countryside. Um, so uh, not anticipating that the disturbance in the urban area would be any greater, although it would be a long term up to nine months in duration and there would be localised impacts uh, and they would be temporary and it would be similar to any other um, infrastructure installation in an urban area. Okay, and the final one, I maybe missed it, but where is the direct connection to the national grid going to be? Or what, what is that? Well, the the connection is as a as a private connection, so it's it's a connection to uh, what the the industry would term as an off taker, um, so an end user, if you like, um, as yet un unidentified. Um, but it's anticipated that uh, an industrial user would directly take the 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 electricity from this uh, development uh, to offset their own energy consumption requirements. However, there would be opportunity for other off-takers to um, utilise the, the infrastructure as well. So the, there's no uh, proposal to connect to the national grid in the event of the end user not taking up the, the supply? There is an option to do that. Um, the, the developer could maybe uh, give us a bit more um, on that um, when it's time for, for them to speak. Um, but my understanding is that it would be possible for uh, the energy from this development to enter the grid uh, or any excess uh, energy that it produces also to be taken off into the grid as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Moore, you have questions? Yes, I have. Thank you, convener. Um, just to start with, I looked at all the organisations that have been consulted and I didn't see either Scottish Wildlife Trust or National Trust for Scotland done that. Seeing as House of Dunn and the Montrose Basin are both likely to be affected to an extent, was it not thought that that would be sensible to consult them? Um, they, they aren't statutory consultees for the purpose of this application. Um, the application was widely publicised um, and was subject of consultation at the pre-application stage. Um, the uh, organisations you've mentioned have not commented on the application. Right. And you've told us how large the solar panel array is, but it's built on a hill. What's the distance between the lowest contour and the highest contour? Um, I'd have to um, me measure that separately. We've, we've considered the application site in terms of its overall size. Um, yes, I'm considering that you're building it on a hillside and therefore it will be more visible than just being flat. Um, yeah, I mean, solar arrays are typically built on on, on hillsides, um, gently sloping hillsides um, tend to be utilised for, for this purpose. Um, the topography of the site, um, the landscape in the area, um, it maybe doesn't come across on the, the slides that you've seen, but it does rise reasonably steeply uh, or comparatively steeply from the A935 up to the, the bottom of the site where it kind of plateaus a little bit and then it uh, it, it rises again um, from from that point. I believe there's a roughly about um, 15 meters in difference in terms of the the AOD heights from across the site. I, I could be wrong on that. Um, the developer will perhaps uh, clarify that as well. Um, but. Typically, yeah, gently sloping sites are, are, are the type of site that's preferred for this type of development. And I might have missed it, but I don't see any sort of survey or report on wildlife. You've got woods round here 
and we've got wild deer. We, okay, it's all right putting in a stock proof fence, but the deer will follow their natural track. Has anything been done to try and ascertain what wildlife we've got in that area and what impact it will have on that wildlife? Um, as uh, indicated, I think it's Appendix 2 um, or 3 uh, attached to the report, um, the developers undertaken um, a, a, an ecology assessment um, of the site and its surroundings uh, that identifies uh, species that would be affected by the proposal um, and relevant mitigations that would be put in place. Um, Again, there's been an assessment done under habitat regs um, uh, as well. The council's undertaken an appropriate assessment of impacts on Montrose Basin. Um, but, uh, you know, the ecology impacts, uh, as far as the council's concerned, or certainly as far as officers are concerned, have been uh, considered appropriately. Right. And... I'm concerned that it's going to have a negative impact on the Montrose Basin. If you visited the visitor centre, there are binoculars and telescopes all around the windows so people can look out. And I'm concerned that if somebody looks the wrong way at the wrong time, they could get their eyesight damaged. Has that been considered, the view from the visitor centre itself? through tele magnification? Um, the application has been considered in terms of its landscape and visual impact. Um, there's also um, been consideration of glint and glare impacts from the development and again there are um, conditions proposed that relate to um, the undertaking of glint and glare assessment should uh, there be a complaint made to the development. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you've led on to that. My final question. I looked at condition nine about glint and glare, and I don't find it at all acceptable. Within two months from receipt, so somebody complains about glint and glare on a sunny September day, and the developer can investigate it in the middle of November when it's misty, surely it should be done at the time, within two weeks, not two months, because the seasons change so quickly around here. You get something that happens on a sunny day, you then have two months, you don't have the same conditions. Would you not agree that that should be shorter period? Um. I'd have to um, have a look at the condition again, councillor, I've got it in front of me, um, right at this moment. Um, I believe it's a, an appropriate condition to deal with the, the matter. It's a, the, a, a fairly standard condition for this type of development. Um, right, okay. I the, the condition to be an appropriately worded condition. I can perhaps interject just briefly, Councillor Nicholl. Um, the applicant has done an assessment of glint and glare impacts and the suggestion is that they are, are unlikely to be any significant impacts at all. The two month period allows for the applicant to engage a specialist contractor to undertake the assessment and to submit that uh, assessment to the Council the methodology for the assessment would need to be agreed with our environmental health colleagues, so it would be ensuring that the assessment was undertaken in appropriate circumstances and that appropriate remediation is, is undertaken. As Mr Agnew has said, the condition reflects conditions that are typically attached to developments of this nature, both by this council in relation to, to previous developments and by Scottish Government reporters in relation to um, appeal decisions for proposals of this nature. Um, if I can also just pick up briefly on a couple of uh, 
points that were raised, there was concern raised that we hadn't consulted uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust. As Mr Agnew again has indicated, SWT is not a statutory consultee within the planning process. They have had opportunity to comment on the application and they have chosen not to do so. Notwithstanding that, in relation to impacts specifically on Montrose Basin and recognising the, the international significance of that, we have consulted with uh, Scottish Natural Heritage and SNH has confirmed it has no objections in relation to the natural heritage impacts associated with the proposal. That's taking account of the ecological appraisal that has been prepared and submitted by the applicant in relation to the development. In relation to House of Dunn and National Trust for Scotland, again, not a statutory consultee within the planning process. They've had opportunity to comment on the planning application. They've chosen not to do so. We have consulted Historic Environment Scotland, who is the government, the national agency with responsible responsibility for safeguarding uh, the built environment, and they have confirmed no objection in relation to the proposal that's before you. Thank you very much for clarification. Uh, just point of information. Scottish Wildlife Trust's head office, who would make comment, is based in Edinburgh. So they might not have seen all the advertising and therefore they may not have been aware of it. Thank you. Is there any other questions to the officers? No other questions. Um, today we have two speakers today. Daniel Ferry from Scottish Power and Sophie Williams from Arcus Consulting. Um, these speakers have five minutes to address the meeting. Okay, you can address the meeting. Morning folks, uh, apologies for breaking protocol earlier. I'm Daniel Ferrier, I'm the Scottish Power Renewables um, the Senior Project Manager uh, and, and Chartered Engineer and Team Leader within the company for new technology delivery. I uh, just want to first of all thank um, 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 uh, the planning officer uh, for the presentation, very comprehensive, and to thank uh, Rudy Kelly from the planning department. He's been very helpful and he has uh, left no stone unturned in terms of his diligent review um, of the application and has compiled a comprehensive list of proposed conditions. Um, I just wanted to just touch on why the Scottish Powers picked up this scheme from the original developer, uh, Boreolis Energy, who received consent um, in 2014 for the scheme. Uh, the scheme is a standalone solar, it's perfect in that it's a gentle south sloping uh, field, large open in nature with minimum features to affect shading, that is production of the scheme. Um, it has reasonably good access off the A90 um, through tracks that are suitable for uh, construction traffic, currently a large amount of agricultural traffic use those uh, local road network to from the A90 to the facility. Um, and also has the benefit of the grid connection, um, as, as Councillor Duff suggested, the Bridge of Dunn uh, substation immediately to the south is a suitable point of connection to the grid. Um, the scheme obviously got consent in a, um, back in 2014. Um, it received letters of support and there was no objections to it. So it had, you know, it, you know, it was seen as favourable, if, if you like, from a planning perspective. So that taking those into account and also looking at the lay of the land as well, you've got the um, uh, Glen Wood, the Glen Skeenal Wood to the east of the site and uh, the Bruce Dam Wood, uh, 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 as the plan officer said, provides sufficient screening. It boxes in the development and limits views throughout the, the surrounding area. Um, I would want to point out as well is that we are proposing further enhancement on the north and um, west side and, and north and east side, uh, we're looking to reinforce the hedgerows that's currently in place and intersperse with silver birch trees along the perimeter of the site. That will provide additional screening over the lifetime of the scheme um, from views from, um, um, from West Bilocchi and along the, the private access track to Mains of Dunn. So that's properties north to west. Um, and uh, uh, the views from the northeast. Um, so hopefully, 
um, that kind of alleviates any concerns in terms of use of properties. There'll be hedgerow reinforcement to the south. Ideally, we would plant trees, but as the land form and the shading from those trees, uh, you wouldn't get so much uh, benefit and it would provide shading on the panels and affect production. Um, in terms of the private wire connection, uh, Councillor Duff is absolutely right. The fallback position, and in normal circumstances, we would go to uh, SHEPD, the distribution network operator in the area, and say, look, where is the nearest point of connection? And they would organize and secure planning, and they would do all the works to connect our facility to the point of connection on the local grid network at Bridge of Dunn. However, we saw a key opportunity to connect into an off-taker at Montrose Harbour and provide direct displacement of their power usage. That has a benefit, obviously, in terms of cost saving and providing green renewable energy, as well as the battery facility can provide different facility to that, that, that off-taker in terms of, um, to, be, to be put uh, simply, clean up the electricity that goes into that facility and protect that facility from brownouts or even blackouts. Um, so those enhancement measures make that a good package for the off-taker and from Scottish Power's benefit, we get um, the ability to build this scheme out sooner than would normally be the case. The solar scheme does have a reasonably good yield, but unfortunately not good enough. And in Scotland, we have high use of system charges for our grid which means that we requested from the planning authority a 10-year validity period because the, the economics currently do not stack up as a standalone basis. And that's why we believe the price of panels will continue to fall over a period of time to allow the scheme on a standalone basis that is connecting into the normal grid substation. Um, we would need that length of period because of the economic uncertainty, certainly with COVID, certainly is, is brought in, in Brexit. Um, that you know, we requested that longer duration for the standalone if the private wire didn't work. The private wire may not work because it is technically challenging and the, the optic may change their mind and say that we don't want it. Um, but for completeness, we added in the seven and a half kilometer private wire route um, so that we had that option uh, to connect in and bring the scheme forward uh, in terms of getting it built sooner and operating sooner so that we can help meet our climate change chart targets to net zero by 2045 sooner um, than would normally be the case. In terms of the questions raised, um, in terms of drainage, yes, we will consider tie-ins to existing uh, drainage networks on either side, especially the field to the northeast of the site has drainage problems. We want to make sure that we don't cause any problems backing up the uh, flow of water there. We would try and attenuate as much of the flow as possible using swales and grass planting will provide some absorption. And by constantly not churning up the ground, um, it will provide um, more attenuation that would normally be the case for the agricultural field. Um, the agricultural field is prime grazing. It's currently used to grow in cereals. Uh, as the councillor pointed out, that the scheme is fully reversible. And we're also proposing a dual, dual use and that we'll be providing renewable electricity, but we'll also have sheep on site grazing the land to control the grass height um, and make sure that it's not overrun with weeds, for example. Um, a third of the site is earmarked for a species rich, um, a species rich grass seed mix. That 20 hectares of species rich grass seed mix will en en enhance the biodiversity um, in the area for pollinating species and also has the benefit for ground nesting birds as well. So I would hope Councillor Moore would consider that. Um, that you have one minute there. left. One minute of your time left. Sorry, yes. Um, there's also, as I said, uh, planting all around the perimeter that has the double benefit of enhancing uh, ecology in terms of allowing bats, etc., to nest, uh, to roost. Um, but there's also tree planting proposed to screen around the existing battery facility. Um, and that, that would be planted with deciduous uh, trees uh, for enhanced ecological benefit. Um, in terms of connection to the grid, the power that is not used by the off-taker would be exported onto the existing grid connection the off-taker uses currently. So the existing two circuits that connect into that facility would be used to export surplus power to the grid 
um, if the off taker, if, if we use the private wire solution, so there is a direct connection to the grid. Um, uh, in terms of glint and glare and impacts from the viewpoint across the Montrose Basin, that is seven kilometres away from the existing facility. I do appreciate the Council's concerns about um, using binoculars, etc. But this has never been flagged up before. We've never came across in a scenario where people's eyesight has been damaged through glare at seven and a half kilometres, certainly. And the panels are designed to absorb as much energy from the sun as possible. So reflection of uh, the sun's rays from the panels is, is less and less of an issue as time has gone by, but gone by as panels have become more efficient. So um, I've hopefully, um, I've not covered every point in the questions and um, I don't know if there'd be ability to ask any question directly, um, but, but that's all the points I wanted to make. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the councillors now have a chance. Is there any questions to the speaker? From the Hands are going up. Uh, Councillor Duff? Yeah, thanks, Convener, and, and thanks to Mr. Ferrier for his, his uh, presentation. I guess just one question. I mean, it, it's a, a 50 megawatt um, development, and I think the battery capacity is 10 megawatts. I mean, I don't quite can't get my head around those numbers, but would that allow the, the end user to perhaps be off grid completely or is that unrealistic in our climate and with our uh, number of days of sun we get in a year? Yes, well, the, unfortunately we can't <laughs> meet all of the demand um, because uh, the winters are particularly brutal in terms of low yield and shorter days. Um, so during the winter we can't meet demand, but the combination of the battery and the solar allows a, a very high percentage of the demand to be met um, by the, the, the renewable energy plant um, with surplus and um, spilled onto the, the grid network to power houses, et cetera, and other businesses in the area through the, the normal means. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Moore, you have questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Ferrier, for clearing up those points. If you had more time to answer questions, what more would you be able to tell us? Um, in terms of the topography, um, the, the landscape and visual assessment has been done based on the negative aspect of, you know, rather flat versus, you know, uh, gently sloping. It's about a 20 metre difference um, in, in terms of, um, um, you know, above sea level, <coughs> raising from in the north, 95 down to 75 in the south. Um, it means that we can, with a nice south sloping, it means that we can pack the panels closer together without them shading each other. So it has the benefits with a south open scheme to, to get as much bang for your buck, if you like, in terms of energy yield per acre. Um, and you want to minimise the footprint and maximise the renewable energy. So it gives with one hand, takes with the other. And that as a result of that landform, um, it has additional uh, landscape and visual. But that those landscape and visual impacts have been obviously assessed and mitigation has been proposed and, and, and deemed acceptable. Uh, sorry, uh, as suggested as being acceptable uh, by my consultant. Thank you very much for that. In uh, terms of the deer tracks, there is a, a, a deer fence uh, around the perimeter of the site um, for security. Um, the ecologist did not consider or did not notice any deer tracks throughout the site, but that doesn't mean to say there isn't any deer tracks throughout the site in extended phase one habitat survey was done over the entire site identifying <coughs> badgers hibernacular for um, snakes, reptiles, um, and, and obviously ground nesting birds as well. Um, so a full suite of, of ecology a, a survey is done with that kind of um, broad brush phase one assessment that was done over the site and the cable route. Thank you very much. Councillor Dunno now. Um, yeah, thanks, Kavina. I'd just like to ask Mr. Ferrier, um, of interest with your uh, saying about the grass seed mix that you're going to be putting down in the biodiversity um, in the area, um, would there be an opportunity for Scottish Power to maybe do um, some community projects, working with children, etc., to explain what you, you're actually doing for the future? Because I know some other power companies uh, do work with the community because obviously, you know, we're going to be digging up roads and things and, and uh, causing a bit of havoc. Um, would it be possible for you um, to, to work with the community at looking at different projects that they're with, you know, within this site, etc.? 
Yes, absolutely. As you allude to, the consultation doesn't stop if we were to get consent. Um, we have to work with the local community, uh, with the community council, um, and, and we're, we're happy to meet with them and explain the programme in more detail, trying to uh, outline uh, uh, if the private wire goes ahead, the programme, so that we can mitigate that, listen to any concerns. But there is an opportunity to look at um, other community benefits as well and work with them. <laughs> Community because the off taker is obviously local, established in yeah. the area for a long time, and Scottish Power has a good reputation of doing the, the community work, especially in the southwest of Scotland. And the, we have a community liaison team dedicated to working with local communities uh, to get the benefits. In terms of works on site, you can appreciate there'll be practicalities about how that would be restricted in terms of an operational plan. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we couldn't look at opportunities out with. Uh, in the surrounding area uh, to work with local communities uh, and help contribute in a positive way uh, uh, to, to things outside the scheme um, in, a, in addition to the benefits of the scheme. So, That's yeah. great, thank yeah. you. <clears throat> thank you for that. Councillor Stark. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Mr Ferrier. Uh, just um, a few questions for you, and you've already touched upon the uh, continuity of uh, power supply, uh, 40 megawatts. Um, in the darkest days of winter, are you able to maintain the battery 10 megawatt uh, storage to full capacity? Um, it's, it's quite a complicated, uh, there's a number of scenarios in which the battery would be used, um, but the battery would be, we would struggle to charge it um, effectively during the winter period, to be honest. Um, we would only charge it and see any opportunities if we were exporting to the local grid network where there was, for example, if there was a, you know, for frequency regulation to maintain a stable flow, we can provide flow to the network to, to provide grid stability services through our battery. Um, and obviously the price of electricity when it's through the roof, we can uh, discharge our battery at that point um, and that as a, as a combination, provide grid stability services. It's very limited in nature given, I mean, th th there's no lying to you, the shorter days and the lower yield during the winter, um, you want to use that power as effectively as possible. Um, and in most cases, the battery may not be used. It would just be direct supply to the off taker and to the grid uh, to minimize it, to maximize efficiency. Okay, that, that, that's understood. Thank you for that. Um, I noticed uh, all the containers that are uh, being um, installed, are they being um, fabricated in Scotland? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, the batteries themselves, well, um, obviously are manufactured abroad. There's very few battery facilities. Uh, I, don't, I think there's battery facilities planned for Europe, um, but the bulk of the battery facilities are and TV modules that are, uh, are in China um, and some battery facilities in South Korea. Um, the batteries would be shipped to um, a, an aggregator who will put them into containers and fit out HVAC, etc., and then send them to the UK. Um, we will look to work with other local suppliers, for example, Red Tea as a local supplier, uh, you know, and, and, and if there is opportunity for longer duration storage. Uh, to come into play, Scottish Power will explore um, um, local solutions first um, before going to, if you like, the default position, which is, is, is buying lithium iron batteries abroad and shipping here. Okay, I just thought that someone like Agreco or someone would have been doing that. Obviously not, but it's an opportunity to miss for Agreco, the uh, economy. Yeah, Agreco could. Um, but they wouldn't manufacture the batteries, they would bring them, the batteries over here, and they would yeah, put them yeah. out in a container, potentially. Um, I don't know too much about um, uh, what service facilities Agreco have in the UK. <coughs> okay, and just, just a final point. Um, the end point, you keep mentioning it as Montrose Port. The end point is kilometres away from the Montrose Port. Well, sorry, the, um, just the general locality. I cannot name who the potential... Uh, well, <laughs> okay, I understand. But it's just that you keep mentioning Montrose <coughs> Port. You're yeah. north of Montrose Port. And okay. people will put two and two together, obviously, I think, on that score. But okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Councillor. Uh, is there any more questions to the speaker? If there's no more questions... Do members wish to make a comment at this stage? 
There's hands up, but they're up, been up it, for a while. Excuse me, convener. Sorry, can I just confirm that Mrs. Williams doesn't want to to add anything further? She should also be given the opportunity. Sorry about that. No, no, it's okay. Thank you. Um, no, I wouldn't like to add anything further. Thanks. Right, thank you. Um, is that Coun Councillor Durno and Duff you, for quest for comments? Uh, no, sorry, I'm just I'm just lowering my hand. <laughs> Councillor Duff, have you put up your hand for? Are we on, are we now on con comments, are we, convener? Yes. I didn't want to jump the gun there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I just want to make a comment first. I think. Uh, there was some reference to a car park and, and there was a, a, an objection raised about the car park on, uh, as I understand it, it's the one probably at the north end of the Mid Links, close to the, the Curly Pond. My understanding is that is actually on Montreux's Common Good account. Um, I, I remember we were approached a few years ago by roads officers wanting to resurface it. And at that time we thought the surface wasn't too bad, so we said no. So I think that's the ownership of it, as, as far as I'm aware. I'm conscious that the council is now going through the common good accounts with a fine tooth comb after the uh, recent court hearing. So that's that one. And, and I guess uh, if it gets churned up and the developer um, reinstates it, that would probably be a good result because it would be uh, they would be paying for it rather than Montrose Common Good or indeed the council. Uh, in terms of the development as a whole, uh, as a, a local Montrose member, and, and obviously at the last planning meeting, we had the Sea Green Development Offshore, which is a massive uh, green development and much to be welcomed. I'm very pleased to see this application come forward. Uh, we talk a lot about green solutions, and this clearly is one. It's a, it's a 40 megawatt solar uh, farm, which would supply equivalent electricity to, to that consumed by 12,000 homes. So um, very, very welcome. It's good news and uh, I'm pleased to see it happen. Thank you very much, Councillor Duff, for your comments. Councillor Sturrock. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Yeah, just uh, I, I too um, welcome this development. It fits into the green um, aspect that the Council is promoting and I think in some ways it touches upon the, uh, the Mercury programme with the Angus Council as well. And, but there's another aspect of, of this where it's, I, I believe I, in supporting it is when we um, had full council in August. Uh, one of the motions was support for the local electricity bill. Now, this scheme uh, ties in to that uh, scenario uh, of supplying local le electricity, obviously. So I would... Uh, have no hesitation in supporting this uh, application. Thank you very much, Councillor Sirik, for your comments. Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you, convener. I'm welcoming this, amazingly enough, but I, I just wish it was going to 12,000 homes rather than to one site. I think we need to be helping people to reduce their e electricity bills and to help get their greener electricity all the way. So if there is any possibility of diverting some of it to residential accommodation, I would be delighted to see that happen. Thank you very much for your comments. Is there any more comments at this stage? No more comments. I'm going to move that we approve this application and grant planning permission. Is that agreed? Agreed. If there, no, if there is no amendment to confirm this decision, that is agreed. 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 Application number 20, oblique 00019, oblique FULM, is hereby approved. Agreed. 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 Right, on to, oh, we better bring back Councillor Braze. Yes, please. Um, and if Mr. Ferrier and Mrs. Williams want to stay, they're free to do so. On the other hand, they can depart if they wish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we hope I'm out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bray is back yet? He is.
Yes, can you turn for raises there? Right. This is the pr proposed application for the land west of East Meathy Farm Bungalow, Lure Forfar. Can the planning officer please show the slides? Yes, could I have the next slide, please, Ali? <coughs> Um, the report advises the committee that there's a plan being submitted for a major development uh, comprising uh, two 32,000 hen capacity free range sheds uh, and associated infrastructure. The plan is submitted by Craig Nathrow Eggs Limited. Could I have the next slide, please, Ali? Uh, the slide puts the site in some context. Um, the site lies around two kilometres south of Forfar. It measures around three hectares um, and two sheds of 152 by 20 by 6.6 .6 metres would be placed on the site. The report indicates that as over 60,000 hens would be, uh, or places for over 60,000 hens would be provided on the site, the uh, development would be an EIA development in terms of schedule one of the environmental impact assessment regulations. Consultation activity uh, in relation to the the, the pan um, has uh, is given at uh, uh, sections three point four to three point six of the report. Uh, officers have confirmed those uh, uh, activities to be acceptable. Uh, they take account of current measures that are in place uh, in relation to COVID nineteen, um, and the earliest an application could be made for this development is the sixteenth of November. The main relevant considerations to development of this nature uh, have been given at uh, section 4.5 of the report. However, uh, the committee is invited to identify any additional uh, material planning considerations that they would wish to see addressed uh, in any application that comes forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, the committee is to note to, we are asked to note the key issues identified in paragraph 4.4. .4. Do members have any other issues that they would like to see addressed? Questions to the officers or question or time to look at that 4.4. The 4.4. Uh, items is loss of prime agricultural land. Is it co comparable with policy PVC 20? Uh, environmental amenity, excess properties, neighbours, land use are not accept unacceptable. Um, flood risks, danger. Any, any councillors got any questions? Councillor Moore. This can be just one. Um, there is, from the look of it, a burn just to the north. Are we, well, we need to know that it's not going to impact on that. Would that be under neighbouring land uses or adverse in landscape and visual effects? If you get a load of hen poo going off into the burn, that could have a nasty effect. Is, is that, that or not? Is that an additional matter you'd like to have added to the considerations, councillor? Well, if it's not already covered, yes, please. So perhaps I can just interject. At paragraph 4.5, we have a bullet point which is impact of the development on the natural environment, including habitats and ecology. So mm -hmm. I would suggest that. In terms of the, the matters that are identified for members, we have flood risk and drainage, which deals with the, the, the general issue of um, potential pollution. Clearly there'll be consultation with Scottish Environment Protection Agency in relation to the <laughs> of any drainage arrangements and potential for pollution on water courses. But in addition, the, the bullet point regarding impact on natural environment and the habitats uh, would also cover the, the drainage issue and potential pollution arising from um, any um, 
runoff or emissions associated with the, the chicken shed. So I would suggest that it's matters that are covered um, both in 4.4 and 4.5. Right, and I don't suppose we can look at the conditions that the hens are going to be under within this, can we? No, it's not. That's uh, that's an animal welfare matter which is uh, regulated by uh, Scottish government through uh, their their relevant agencies. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. You've got a question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to, I think to be honest, my my question's probably covered by bullet point two and four point four. But I mean, where we've had previous developments like this. Um, I, I remember there being issues with smell and noise from, from neighbouring houses. And looking at this on the map, it looks like it is kind of um, well away from many houses. And, and I would have thought it's, it sounds like a good location for it. But I, I think it's covered under 4.4 .4 bullet point to, to the, the sort of environment for people living nearby. So I'm quite happy that the, the conditions look quite, comp or at least the, 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 the points we're going to look at look quite comprehensive to me. Thank you very much for that. Councillor Braze. Yes, thank you, convener. Uh, just uh, to echo what Councillor Duff says, I, I'm very confident that all the, the points that are of uh, concern or indeed relevance to me uh, will be covered uh, in any application. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Is there any more questions or, or comments? If not, um, we will proceed to grant Councillor Brown's way in uh, convener. I, yeah, I can, I can one, question, one question, I'd maybe missed it. Uh, is, is this for chicken rearing or is this for eggs? Yeah, by Craig Nathro, hen, um, eggs, councillor, so... Um, we're assuming that the hens would be layers rather than broilers. Okay, thank you. So if there's no more questions, we're going to approve this application. Um, there appears to be no application number with it, but uh, is that agreed? I just interject. It's just really to note the key issues and to add anything further should members so wish. Right, that's very good. So we all agree anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the end of the meeting and thank you all very much for participating and uh, apologise for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for the dog. Marini's checking for a walk. <laughs>